Hi, everybody. I know I've said that I was going to do more videos and I've been not very good at doing that, but, you know, global pandemic and all that. But today it's very, very exciting because I'm here with Georgie Williams and I cannot wait uh, to hear everything they have to say, but I'm going to let them introduce themselves and give us a lot more information. Thanks, Virginia. Uh, hi, my name is Georgie. Uh, I am the founder of the Slash Queer Project, which is an accessible educational platform for gender and sexuality history around the world. I'm an academic specialist in non cisgender identities from a transnational perspective. I'm an activist and I'm a non binary transgender person myself. Um, I like to call myself professionally queer, so I think that's a pretty good summary. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a good profession. Very spot on also with whatever it's going on in the world. I think um, there's a lot of need for people like you educating from a very um, like real and factual and kind point of view about what's happening because I think we're receiving a lot of information from both sides and and I think only one side has a lot of science and a lot of facts on their hands. And, and we're just going through this phase that all the information comes the same. And I, I think that's a big problem. Like we're overwhelmed by data and it's very difficult to just digest and, and filter what we need to hear from now. So I think your role is so important just to educate factually. Um, but tell me um, a little bit more about what is a day or, or what is exactly that you're trying to do and how you are achieving it? Okay, so I did a master's in gender research back in 2016. Um, I uh, come from a, a, a low socioeconomic status background, so accessing higher education was incredibly hard for me. And when I got there, uh, I experienced two different things. First and foremost, I was dazzled by the things that I learned. And then I was angry because I realized the things that I learned only existed in postgraduate lecture halls. And I believed that everybody should have the opportunity to learn these things. I don't think that human culture and diversity and, and history should exist behind uh, a wall of student loans. So I ended up deferring my PhD position at the end, uh, no, about midway through 2019. Um, I was enthusiastic about academia, but I have a, a complicated relationship with it. And due to personal reasons, I decided to step back from the PhD process. And instead I took all of the money that I had saved aside for it from various jobs and roles dating back to when I was 15 years old, when I first started working and I decided to go to where all of these communities were that I'd learned about on my postgraduate degree. So that is how the Slash Queer podcast started. I loaded everything into a rucksack and I decided to get out there and ask these communities to tell these stories in their own words. Uh, so we traveled through America, with the USA for three months. Uh, we did a month in Japan and we did a month in Indonesia. Um, and it was about taking these stories, putting them on a platform where anybody could listen to them. And my role as the host is to uh, contextualize and translate concepts where appropriate, um, to introduce some terminology that's quite complex and quite intimidating when we're talking about things like gender and sexuality and ensure that these histories were being recorded in a way that was conscientious, um, not only of individuals lived experience, but also culturally conscientious as well. Uh, so at this point in time, the Slash Queer podcast has a listener base in 95 countries around the world. Wow. We, yeah, we are a Kinsey Institute archived podcast. So the Kinsey Institute is the largest uh, archive for gender and sexuality research in the world. Uh, it's over in Indiana. So first half of the season so far has been archived there. Um, so the project also doubles as an oral histories project as well, because so often, particularly in colonized communities, these histories have been recorded in the words of supposed anthropologists and other investigators in a way that's incredibly biased and often inaccurate. So the job of the Slash Queer Project is to take all of this, make it accessible, make it straightforward, put the control of how it's disseminated into the hands of our interviewees, 
and make sure that it is a community focused project in the sense that individuals can feed back, they can tell us what we should be covering, how we should be covering it, what stories need to be brought into the light and made accessible for as many individuals from as many different backgrounds as possible. So that is the mission at this point in time. Oh my God. And then COVID happened. And I imagine your trip, um, I mean, I guess your point, your your goal is to get back on the road and, and keep traveling and doing that. Is that I imagine it right? Where possible, yes. <laughs> um, so for the first season, um, we did three episodes in the US, three episodes in Japan, four in Indonesia. Uh, and then I landed back in the country first week of March of last year, skin of my teeth. Um, and then the plan was always to do three or four episodes in the UK. A uh, third of those episodes is uh, being released as of next week. Then we've got one more episode in the UK. We're looking at doing three or four in Ireland. And then that wraps season one. So season two, we would be looking at mainland Europe and there are a whole host of stories we want to cover out there. Um, so we definitely wanna do as, as comprehensive a trip as possible. And then in the far flung future, at some point, if we could secure funding, we'd also be looking at doing a season three through uh, the rest of Southeast Asia and also parts of Africa as well. Wow, and it's, do you find there's a lot of differences in all those cultures or is there any common is there anything in common that you're finding whenever you go back to the roots that can you know that it's like a wow moment like there it is once again we're hearing the same things coming from different humans all over the world there are stark differences and variances but there are also these overarching themes um you know the thing that i have loved is that I've gone to all of these different places that conceptualize gender in completely different ways um, and have completely different perspectives on sexuality and on kinship and what that means, you know, to, to be bonded to one another. But what you find, no matter where you go, is that people who, from a Western perspective, would usually exist on the margins because they are, you know, diverse in their gender and sexuality, they create their own culture they create their own families they create their own rituals and and a sense of community and that is the thing that's really inspiring is that you can go anywhere in the world and there will be this rich tapestry of of histories and these vibrant fascinating identities that have been nurtured and upheld as important parts of their their society be that on a, a small scale or a large scale um so yeah i think the the thing that ties them all together is that where there is variation where there is diversity to some extent or another at some point in the history that has been honored and recognized and celebrated um sometimes in the face of adversity and sometimes just as part of the mainstream and that's really inspiring it is and i need to ask you this because you're the expert and there's this huge debate and and feminist is being caught in this war of mm -hmm. you know for or against and um I got trapped once, I said something about genders one, and I got trapped in a thousand three hundred comments of people telling me you do not dare to call yourself feminist because you're fighting for men and, and wow, wow, wow. And um, I think that is one of the most important debates feminists is having at the moment. And I think we have the opportunity to do things right and to welcome and, and to understand that there's no others, that it's not about us or the others. And it's a large group of vulnerable people that as feminists, we need to be having at the very front of the mind because they're having every struggles that we're having and their very own on top. How do we get all that hate, all that lag, all that, I mean, maybe we can fix it, Georgie, who knows? Maybe you and I <laughs> can fix the problem. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's a hell of a problem. And I mean, I never call myself an expert because I think nobody can be an expert in the human experience, right? I call myself a specialist for a reason. And that diversity of human experience is at 
the core of what feminism is. Um, feminism is always about acknowledging, you know, what makes us diverse, what makes us capable and saying, for the longest time, patriarchal power structures have determined that women only have value if they hit certain checkboxes, if they exist within certain parameters, right? Those parameters are by and large uh, ableist, they are heteronormative, they're often classist, and I also think they're incredibly cisnormative as well. And that's the thing, is that feminism should always be intersectional. There is no one universal female experience. When we talk about women, women of color are different to white women. Able-bodied women are different to disabled women. Transgender women are different to cisgender women. None of these differences negate the fact that they are women. They are still women regardless of that difference. And I think when we try and gatekeep what womanhood is, what we do in turn is we say, we are allowing a patriarchal power structure to say, okay, you have to fit in these boxes to be a woman. We play into the hands of an oppressive system. And I think being conscientious of the fact that there is space for all women in the world is really important. And saying there is no hegemonic power structure that says that one particular type of woman can speak on womanhood more than anybody else. We can all only speak for our lived experience. Speaking for others is always an incredibly difficult thing to do. And something that I think many of us do without thinking a lot of the time. Yeah, I, now, you know, I'm speaking uh, about the experiences of women as somebody who is assigned female, but identifies as non-binary. So it's an incredibly complex issue, but I think ultimately the way forward with feminism is being awareness, aware of the fact that there is strength in numbers and femininity and, and womanhood are not concepts that exist within a box. And they never have throughout time, throughout different cultures, different classes. Womanhood has always looked different. And I think that is not something to be afraid of. That's something to be celebrated. Could hear you all day. I'm just like nodding, <laughs> like, yep, totes, <laughs> hell yes. <laughs> that's, that's literally my kind of feminist is normally listen to people and be like, totes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I agree. I have, I keep having those conversations a lot with friends or family, a little bit more in large numbers, maybe in, in the family shop about what about if a man gets into a restroom as a woman and rape us, like, they don't have to dress as a woman. They can get to the bathroom and rape us. They are actually raping women. They don't have to just pretend to have an identity. Like the men that we should be scared of, the men that we are scared of, they don't normally are the kind of men that would put themselves into the position of going as low as being a woman just to right. harm us like they don't value womanhood and and they are surrounded by a lot of toxic masculinity and and pride of being men right. that for them they will be just going so low to do that and they don't have to why don't we worry so much about the men that are actually raping women yes. instead of the ones that hypothetically maybe could hurt women or why don't we focus about the non-binary or the transgender people that are suffering today? We have the numbers, we've heard their stories, like we have all the information, we have to just show sympathy and kindness, but we're more worried about potentials, maybe victims with the stories that are happening in our heads. And I think, I never ever say you don't get to call yourself a feminist if so I, I understand that families that hold that view it's because they genuinely believe that this situation is potentially hurting women I just think they're not they're not seeing the full picture and I think there's so much information in front of us and there's so many stories that yeah. it's difficult for me to comprehend I think these thought experiments, these thought experiments are so damaging for the trans community. And I think the problem is, is that 
I understand those fears. Um, I understand those anxieties about, you know, uh, being vulnerable to people that are predatory. But that's the problem, right? Is the assumption that trans individuals are naturally predatory, and that's not the case. Being a trans person, especially being a trans woman, um, is incredibly dangerous. Um, trans women are incredibly vulnerable. Um, and the, the stigmatization and taboo around the trans identity, um, it would be ridiculous for any individual to go through that process in order to victimize another. Um, by and large, individuals that are seeking to abuse power aren't going to go through that entire process to do it. And I think, I, I think the problem here as well is that the idea of kind of naturalism that comes into feminism as well, you know, what's a natural woman it is ableist as well. You know, this idea of, of that trans women aren't ever truly women based on particular experiences that they may or may not have. That's actually exclusionary to cis women as well. Um, not to mention the fact that I think there's this problem with kind of the policing of spaces. You talk about policing of bathrooms. Um, <laughs> and I, I know of cisgender women who dress or appear more masculine than what's considered the, the norm in this regard, who have been challenged on being in these bathrooms, which is bizarre. We're now excluding cisgender women from these spaces because of this trans panic. Um, and, you know, when we talk about what defines womanhood and often you know, trans exclusion radical feminists argue on things about how, you know, trans women will never have children. You know, they'll never give birth and things like that. But there are a great host of cisgender women who are infertile that will never be able to do anything like that. You know, when we start gatekeeping what womanhood is, we exclude more people than we think we do. Oh because like I said, the female experience is not universal. And I think a lot of this hostility comes from a misunderstanding, especially of trans people, that transness is not about dressing up one way and being your assigned gender. You know, trans women are women and they are probably far more afraid of being in these bathrooms and than anybody so. should be of them. Yeah, absolutely. But fairly so if you get the numbers, I mean, that's a statistically proven. I mean, they have it much worse. And whenever a lot of the battles I hear in, in this debate is like, I'm not against them. I just don't think, I think we just have to protect them as what they are, which is transgender women, which I find like, <laughs> I don't know if they want to be defended as transgender women. I don't, I mean, and I think it's not our choice. I think the whole point of this is why should I care about other people's identity? Why do I think my opinion about how anybody else in the world identify with or make them happy or feel comfortable matters? Like, why do I have a say? Yeah, and I mean, where do we draw the line then with segregating women? If we start segregating them based on uh, assigned gender at birth, you know, do we then start segregating based on race, race or yeah. physical ability? And I mean, to a certain extent, that already does implicitly happen, doesn't it? Um, and so I think that is incredibly damaging to our community. Um, it's it's such a complex and heated debate, and it's definitely upsetting. You know, I personally, I I have had. I had an experience uh, on Twitter back in June where in showing my support at the uh, trans rights protest, um, I was pretty badly dogpiled um, by trans exclusionary radical feminists who, based on my appearance at the time, uh, assumed that I was a trans woman. And the hatred that spewed forth was horrible. And at the time, I mean, I actually avoided saying I wasn't a trans woman because there's obviously nothing to be ashamed of yeah. <laughs> about being a trans woman. You know somebody that I knew ended up tweeting and saying that I wasn't and I had to explain well I am trans but I'm a non-binary trans person that is assigned female but the aggression and the assumptions that were made I had somebody telling me that uh, I was wearing a jacket that said trans rights or fist fights um you know in the anarchist sense um 
you know, because I don't believe that trans rights should be compromised on, you know, trans people are human beings, they deserve basic fundamental human rights. Um, and I had somebody suggesting that my jacket um, gave away my... Oh no, I missed you. Oh, no. um, oh, I think I've missed you, sorry. Did you lose me? Yes. It's all sorry. good, where did, you, where did you get me from? Your jacket, somebody said that and I've lost so, it. So, yes, because of my, because they said because of my jacket that I, I was threatening women and children with my with uh, violence, um, that it gave away my true sex because it was obviously so violent and that I was threatening these women and children with my male fists. Um, and it's funny because there tends to be this rhetoric of, of um, you know, how these people always, they can always tell, they, they always know, right? And in this moment, I mean, as somebody who's non-binary and, sometimes I like to pass as cis because it makes my life easier but sometimes I definitely mix up my appearance I was experiencing just buckets of gender euphoria because none of these strangers online could tell what gender I'd been assigned <laughs> at birth so you know that was great but also oh, like win. yeah but I had a weekend where I was wrongly assumed to be a trans woman and it was aggressive and violent. People tried to get me kicked off of my PhD course. People tried to get me kicked out of the charity that I volunteered with for three years. Um, I cannot begin to imagine what it is like to be an out trans woman. It is a terrifying prospect and I have immense amounts of respect for my trans sisters in that regard. Yeah, it's, how do you, do you consider yourself a feminist after <laughs> after all this or are you i'm knowing more and more people just saying like look sorry i'm down off this train and i'll stick because i think people is like virginia but like is this becoming something you know that that represent only white women blah 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 and i'm like well that's not what i believe in i don't think that's what feminist is and i'll just fight my whole life for the meaning of feminists that I truly and passionately believe about. But I can totally get, and I just blame nobody whenever I'm seeing, you know, black women or um, yeah. people in the, you know, trans spectrum saying like, look, so, sorry, you can keep that label. Don't want it anymore. Um, so how do I you mean, feel about it? That's fair. Like I will never, pol I'll never police the way that people choose or do not choose to identify in that regard. Cause I think, what we call ourselves is irrelevant it's about mission you know um and about what we want to achieve i absolutely identify as an intersectional feminist um because it's my belief that if you let a bad group of people sully your perspective on an entire population then you never really cared about their rights anyways right and it, the same goes for kind of the trans rights movement if, if a trans person is mean to you and you therefore don't support trans people as a consequence then you never respected trans people, right? Because people shouldn't have to be nice to you for them to deserve their rights. Um, don't get me wrong. I have a particular place in me for the anger that I feel with trans exclusionary radical feminists. Um, but I don't believe they represent what feminism is to me, you know? And at the end of the day, I, I'm not surprised when I find out that there have been individuals who consider themselves to be trans exclusion radical feminists that then through that figure out that they're trans, you know, and some of them have experiences where their child comes out and it does change their perspective. And at the end of the day, you know, these intersectional rights exist so that everyone has access to them, regardless of whether or not they've been a good or a bad person at any point, they need to be there, you know, and yes, trans exclusionary radical feminists are a terrible example of what I believe feminism to be. But I think the feminist cause is bigger than that. Oh, yeah. um, and I think when we are more vocal about what it means and, and that inclusivity, it does change people's perspectives. Um, and I think that's what it means to kind of outstay the trend, you know, to integrate it as your, your individual praxis and the way that you approach problems in your day-to-day -day life. You know, fem feminism is, is a thing that it's, you do it. It's not something that you are, it's something that you do on a daily basis. And I think we reshape what it means when we practice it in a conscientious way every day. 
I love it. And I love what you said about um, like about the rights and thing. Like I, I was just thinking like we fight for the rights to even those, even the women that are hating feminists, even the women that are making feminists into something that is not what we believe in, we're fighting for them too. We want them to have, you know, all the things that society are um, taking away from them. And I think that is so powerful. I think the kindness and and the that approach of you look my my fight and what I'm trying to do here is bigger than these and I really hope you benefit from it too and with that in mind I'll keep fighting and to be honest I've had very interesting conversations with people I severely disagree with uh, mm. in this topic I mean I'm loving this conversation with you but I'm listening because we first of all we agree so there's not much of debate but also I think yeah you know these from a completely first-hand um, angle but I've had conversations with people that are against and I, I would love to invite them and have a talk to them like just a normal conversation because there is room to talk and I think that's the way we're going to move things forward like with kindness and just trying to see their point and but there's so much aggression I, I find this we're in a so polarized thing on internet at the moment and it feels like everything everybody's on war and everybody has to be the wokest and or or suddenly being woke is the worst there's no middle <laughs> there's no middle ground either you are not woke enough or you're too woke and hate you it just feels like a little difficult to navigate and i think we need to go back to the kindness and the conversations yeah it's it's becoming a, an incredibly polarized conversation um and i think what well, we need is space for growth you know opportunities for people to be reflexive and self-aware and progress um and i'm not talking about people that have like <laughs> you know obviously been incredibly violent and abusive you know because like obviously there should be consequences for that behavior oh, yeah. but i think so often and you see this in many kind of left-leaning movements that it's kind of like you are expected to kind of know the lingo and how to behave right out the gate. And if you stumble at a, a block or two, you know, there's an element of kind of demonization there. And I, I told students, I've said this at many talks before, nobody just, you know, drops out of the uterus knowing all of this, right? Like we all come from different backgrounds. We all have a lot to learn. And there will be times when we say something wrong or we approach a subject in the wrong way or, we don't listen in the way that we should and I think that's very human you know and as long as you're not platforming yourself as a voice for a community and then saying the wrong thing about that community I think we should all be given opportunities to say you know what I have a lot to learn here and there should be environments in which it is safe to do so I have always put myself out there as a person who fields stupid questions because I can because I uphold myself as an educator and that makes it my responsibility, you know? Um, and I like it when people have these moments where they say, I wanted to ask about this, but I didn't know how. And I can say, come to me, <laughs> let's talk about this and let's see how we both feel about it on the other side. And it can be so inspiring when, you know, somebody comes away from a conversation like that and they feel more comfortable and more equipped to support a movement as well. Because I think we all need to be provided with the same tools and knowledge in order for social movements to progress. Love it. Again, one of my, mm -hmm, yes, what she say, what she say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna, um, well, you're gonna have a written interview um, about feminism and a little bit more about you in the um, website that of course I'm gonna be sharing. But before I let you go to your Friday night, um, I just want to ask you, what would you tell us to do next like if, if somebody's listening and somebody you know you, you just make somebody reflect and be like yeah that she knows or they know what they're talking about and I want you know what can I do next what's next what do you advise I think our power our strength always comes in numbers and that doesn't have to be as overtly an activist behavior 
as people think it is to kind of to create communities to to network you know um i am a firm believer in direct action and mutual aid and supporting one another and i think if we want to see feminism progress it's about creating that sense of community holding a dialogue and supporting one another you know we all have a platform right be it you know physical or virtual or whatever and sometimes it's about saying you know what I can't speak on this experience it's not mine but I do know or know of this person who can and that's why I'm going to share what they have to say on my platform and creating this interconnected web of individuals who all speak from their own position with something to contribute to the conversation and the dialogue that we're having about these rights and say okay with all of the skills and attributes and all of the knowledge that we all bring together, how do we move forward? And it, it's incredible what you can learn from working with your community. You know, you can uncover that there are people that have a great wealth of experience in something that you may never experience yourself. And there's a huge amount of power in that. Our strength has always come in numbers. And I think even now we can congregate in spaces virtually and even through voicing our experiences and being aware of what one another have gone through, that can give us incredible perspective and it can show us how we move forward with our movements, how we make them more inclusive and, and how we actually lay the groundwork for the kind of radical change we want to see in the future. I love, I love that we all have a platform. I think it's so important. I think we all wait to be like, I don't have any responsibility. I don't have a hundred thousand followers. But we all have so much opportunity. I mean, literally dinner tables, world change in dinner tables and one person at a time. Like that's how we keep moving forward. So being conscious of the power of our own platform is a brilliant end. So I'm going to put obviously all the um, handles for the amazing podcast and things like that so people can have a listen. And thanks a million for coming. Um, I'm just going to go and listen it myself tonight and mm -hmm. have a little bit of a discussion with my husband. But uh, yeah, it was great. And I cannot wait for the written one and read what you have to say. Thank you so much, Virginia. And thank you for inviting me onto your platform as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you.